John Tiller Bonner, Lives of a Biologist, Adventures in a Century of Extraordinary Science, Chapter 2, Becoming a Biologist, 1920-1940. In subtle ways, my mother had an even greater influence on me than my father. She was a person of enormous internal strength, something that was not well hidden. It was obvious the moment she entered the room. She was a handsome rather than a beautiful woman. She always complained that her nose was too big, as were her hands. But I think those two features were the key to her attractiveness. She had a face full of character and her hands were strong and competent. Part of the reason she was so conscious of what she considered her deficiencies was that her mother, who had been a great beauty in her youth, and really remained so in her stately old age, was forever telling her daughter that she was somewhat imperfectly made, if not an ugly duckling. I think most women would have been permanently crushed by such continuous, unencouraging comments. But my mother had two great defenses against this and all other adversities. She discussed everything with her older children and no doubt with others before we came along, so that she was always had the therapy of telling someone rather than keeping it pent up. Much more important, however, was the simple fact that she was a person of extraordinary self-assurance. It just oozed out of her. That assurance gave her the freedom to enjoy amusing incidents and not to feel inhibited in showing that pleasure. As I look back at our relationship, I suppose all of those things were important to me and no doubt I tried to emulate what I admired. But the real bond between us was my admiration of her quite exceptional intelligence. This manifested itself in her wide reading and the way she understood what she had read. What she had read. More to the point, she was intelligent about life, about people about what was going on in the minds of her children. She knew exactly what to tell us, which was far more than most parents even tell their offspring. But she never said the wrong thing or stepped over the line she had drawn for herself. I can remember her telling me when I was in my teens, with amusement in her voice, that when she returned from her honeymoon, her mother, much to her surprise, immediately took her to one side to ask about all the details of what went on in her nuptial bed. She wanted to be sure all systems were go. I have only dim memories of my childhood. We lived in New York City and then in Long Island for my first 10 years. I remember being very unhappy as a teenager, but I do not really remember why. My mother kept a diary from 1930 to 1935, but unfortunately she says nothing about herself and her life. It is all about the daily activities of her four boys, our ages spent 10 years making limited reading with entries such as Henry vomited at lunch and uh, similar historic events. The annual summary pages are the most interesting. 
After the first year, she says about me, John is uh, pig-headed and argumentative, but strangely thoughtful and sweet, very bright. Things are a bit better by 1935. John has improved unbelievably. He has become articulate, much less shy, and his brain is working clearly and not in the former muddled fashion. As uh, must be clear from those diary fragments, Ma liked her children mainly because of their potential. She was impatient with childishness. When I would do something that was atavistic, she would fix me with a glacial stare and say, I can hardly wait until you grow up. She did favor older ones, and Paul and I received more attention. Tony, who was eight years younger than I, spent more years than any of us with a nanny. I never liked nannies. On the whole, they seemed uh, quite horrifying to me. Just an extra someone to boss one about. I remember one in particular who was uh, very strict and uh, told me uh, sternly that masturbating was uh, bad for me. I would lose spinal fluid and become quite a uh, round-shouldered. Ma had remarkable control over herself. She always said the right thing and always had the correct expression to go with it. Quality that enabled her to become highly skilled poker player, game she loved. My father was also a dict and a member of a Thanatopsis club, which included the whole act of literati and Broadway friends. But they often played with a large group at home or at the houses of friends, and my mother could then join in and demonstrate her wonderful skills. When I look back at this now, I am reminded of the Marquise de Châtelet, brilliant mathematician and Voltaire's mistress, who then, short of cash, would stand on Versailles for a spot of cards, coming back with enough money to last her a long time. Grandpa used to tell us to never play cards with strangers, but it was Ma who taught me the real lesson. She joined us for a family game of poker one evening. The stakes were appropriately low. She and I had a bit of duel, and uh, she absolutely flattened me. As she left, she said that I must improve at the game before I played with others. I was furious in my humiliation, but it had the peculiar effect that I have never had any desire to gamble for the rest of my life. I so disliked that sinking, powerless feeling of losing that I am never wanted to have it again. This helped me years later uh, during the war when I was in the army. I was sent to Florida to test some equipment and I shared my compartment on the train with a pleasant-looking young man of my age who asked me if I would like to play some poker. I said yes, but I would not play for money, which he thought amusing and absurd, and asked me why. I explained that I was incapable of winning. After a period of silence, he said to me that he had a confession to make. He was a professional gambler. He was on his way to a new job in a casino. Uh, 
and he needed to keep his hands in. Would I mind if he practiced? Naturally, I said no, and he processed to deal about eight hands of a blackjack, and then asked me to check him. He went around the circle, and for each one he named the bottom, face down card, while I looked, and he had everyone right. Quite unnerved, I said, I don't suppose you would tell me how you do this. He laughed pleasantly and said, and said that I supposed correctly. I did ask him if the cards were marked, and he looked rather insulted and said if I had a deck, he would do the same with my cards. I have been playing solitary ever since. Life in Lacoste Valley, Long Island, in the late 1920s, was in my imagination of the distant past exactly like atmosphere created by Scott Fitzgerald in The Great Gatsby. The men wore white flannel trousers in the summer heat, and the women wore flowing dresses and the white brimmed straw hats. Bootleggers in the dark serge suits appeared in the black cars carrying cheap suitcases full of spirits and French wines. Deadly croquet was played on a lawn in front of the house. The children had the woods, the ponds, ponds and the marshes to explore. It was there that I first became fascinated with out-of-doors fascination that later led me into biology. My parents had even increased circle of friends, many of them in the worlds of journalism, literature, and the arts. The regulars were Franklin P. Adams, FPA, who used a captivate as children by tapping out tones with a pencil on his large white teeth. George S. Kaufman and Mark Connell, Connelly, the playwrights, Dorothy Parker, Edna Ferber, Harpo Marx, Alfred Lund, Lynn Fontaine, and many others. Alexander Woolcott, one of the original contributors to New Yorker, and a central figure among the popular literati, was their closest friend, for in a kind, sterile sort of way he had a permanent crush on my mother. None of this made much of an impression on me, except that someone was nice to the children. I think the only time I was really impressed was when Harold Ross, the editor of New Yorker, appeared and sat down in our living room for some time, before he suddenly said, Oh, I forgot, I left someone in the car. That someone turned out to be Ginger Rogers. Even to me, at that uh, preglodular age, she seemed so beautiful. How could one possibly forget and leave her in a car? It turned out they were childhood friends, but that explained nothing as far as I was concerned. Ma was quite open about her uh, fondness for Alexander Volcott, just as he was about his feeling for her. It was harmless affair. He once told her, and of course she told us, that he got more pleasure out of the good bowel movement than sex, which uh, can hardly be described as a passionate declaration. He admired her intelligence, and she admired his wit, as indeed we all did. One of his standard jokes was uh, 
how he could successfully murder my father, but in fact, they were good friends. When we lived in Lacoust Valley, Wolcott rented a cottage from my grandfather, where he stayed quite a few months. Once a week, my brother and I would go down and he would read to us for a couple of hours. He read us good, sentimental children's stories about dogs and the glory and his mellifluous voice, and we loved it. In his mellifluous voice, and we loved it. Woolcott told my mother that he thought I was intelligent, which he immediately repeated to me. I was flattered then. But later I discovered it was a barrier between us. When I pursued a university career, I began to make him nervous. I do not think I was either pedantic or arrogant, although perhaps I was. But he had both a fear and a faint dislike of someone who chose their intellectual life. He overcame it uh, to some extent for the sake of my mother, but we never were on easy terms after I had grown up. On my 16th birthday, he suddenly sent me a pair of gold cufflinks holding two fragments from a huge find dinosaur eggs discovered by Roe Chapman Andrews in the Kobe Desert, and it, it came characteristically amusing letter. It ends. I think you will be justified in regarding your cufflinks as antiques. Roy Chapman Andrew, who headed the aforesaid expedition and who gave the uh, shell fragments to me in a packing some years ago, airily fixed their age as 90 million years but I seem to detect in a Mr. Wells, H.C., in the science of life, tendency to fix their age nearer 50 million years. In my, I am myself a conservative by nature, so when I had to declare them customs authorities at the port of San Francisco, I contended myself that they were more than a hundred years old. Dr. Andrews told me that the only other person to whom he had given similar pieces of a dinosaur shell was Jack Barrymore. Barrymore said that anyone who had been an actor, as long as he had, was accustomed to the thought of having old eggs thrown at him, all of which leaves me time and space only to wish you many happy returns of last Tuesday. A. Woolcott. I was always sorry I made him uncomfortable. Those dinosaur eggs press an automatic button in my memory. My brother Paul took a course at Harvard with Professor Longdon Warner on oriental art in which he described archaeological expedition to the Kobe Desert. One day his caravan met with that of Roy Chapman Andrews, whom he knew to be there. Professor Warner went over on his camel to Great Andrews by saying, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, in which point Andrews drew himself up and said, The name is Roy Chapman Andrews. Some years later, Warner went to hear Andrews lecture on his expedition, and Andrews said, On this day we met the caravan of Professor Warner from Harvard, and he mistook me for a man named Livingstone. One summer, Woolcott invited my parents, my older brother, and myself, to his summer place on an island in Lake Bomosin in Vermont. I remember enjoying in a hugely 
for had some amusing people there and we played all sorts of grown-up games. Three things stand out in my memory. One is that before our visit, Harpo Marx had been a guest. Some uh, picnickers had decided to land on the back on the island to have their lunch, numerous families with children. Someone wanted to call the police, but Harpo said, I leave it to him. He took off all his clothes, found a hatchet, and went to tearing through the woods in their direction. They were gone in no time. Another was that Walcott's nice secretary, Mr. Brown, who had smiling, rather sheepish face and a shock of unruly hair, got in an argument with someone, I forgot him, but I remember the man shouting at him, you had a face like a loose toilet seat. The third was a play reading one evening. The play was Front Page, an amusing, popular Broadway production that took a view of the fast and racy world of a newspaper. My mother had one of the female roles, and I read the part of one of the tough reporters, which involved my calling her all sorts of names. Suddenly, she stopped the show and said, You had to give me another part. part. I can't have my son talk to me like that. We finally calmed her down. World events mostly passed me by during those early years of my life, but two things do stand out. One, when I was seven, was the feeling of excitement that infected everyone uh, when Lindbergh had successfully crossed the Atlantic. The other was the great crash of a stock market in 1929. My parents and their friends were playing croquet and the periodic bulletins came over the radio. I can remember Woolcott shouting that he had just lost his shirt, but he seemed to take a philosophically almost as a joke. My father had been working as a vice president in Grandpa, his father-in-law, silk business. In 1930, they had a great fight, and in a rush we went to live in France. The gloom of our move persisted for some time. We rented an unattractive villa in Vacresson, outside of Paris, a non two cherry house decorated with appalling test. My father was restless, tried with mixed success to occupy his energies writing short stories. My mother was plagued by unpleasant stomach problems and suffered a good deal despite her stoicism. We boys thought friends pretty interesting and didn't really notice the drama of our parents' problems, of which we were largely ignorant. We spent a lot of time with Alphonse and Alphonsine, the couple who did everything in the house. They were irreverent and jolly, and Alphonse was full of boys' tricks that were sometimes cruel, but always absorbing. One day he told us he would get rid of a dog that kept coming to the house and uh, pestering us all. He wanted us to be sure we saw, we saw the action, which uh, consisted of rubbing the dog's rear end with some gasoline on a rag. Poor dog sped of horrible agony. It was an image I had never been able to erase from my mind. I had been a numb witness to a torture scene. I had become an avid stamp collector at the time, and would 
bicycle to nearby their cell uh, to squander my allowance in a small, delicious stamp store. Alphonse took us to wanderings, circuses, and country fairs. They also took pleasant walks in a nearby wood with the unlikely name Saint Cucufa, where Napoleon's Josephine caught a cold that was literally her death because she wore a wet dress to fully reveal her rather splendid figure. I don't know if the story is true, but we certainly believed it as we walked around the small lake, hoping she would appear in her boat with her clinging garments. Relief came for my parents many months after they had been uh, in Vaucresson. First, Alexander Woolcott came for an extended visit, which bucked them up, and then Grandfather Staley came to make peace. I never knew what was said, but it was successful, and my father became more relaxed, and my mother slowly came into bloom again. The three older boys were sent to a boarding school in Switzerland near Coppe, down the lake from Geneva. We were there for three years. I was ten when we began, Paul was twelve, and Henry seven. Despite the fact that it was a period of growing strain for me, I had begun my general adolescent unhappiness. I loved, I loved life in that school. There were about 75 boys from 18 to 77, from 18 to 7 years of age. Yet despite that spread, the teaching was exceptionally good. In fact, I skipped a grade automatically when I returned to America, and it was certainly not because of any precocity or scholastic ability on my part. I was very average student. I do have a few odd memories of the teaching. One was the myopic math teacher whacking the palms of one's hand with a ruler if one had caused a disruption in the class or had made a messy job of copying into one's notebook the daily lesson of the blackboard. Despite the fact that we made great fun of him, we knew as a teacher he was the best, and we loved him for it. I remember our French teacher telling us that Racine was far superior to Shakespeare because he described the same gamut of human emotions using half of a number of words. Now that the great rift had healed, my parents decided that they would continue to live in Europe, but that as much as they liked France, they had to get out of the Haidos Villa. Because they had many friends in Britain, in 1932 they moved to London and rented a very pleasant house. Here life blossomed for them both, and immediately they entered a whirlwind of social activity. There were two worlds in which they lived. One was made up of their many distinguished American friends, who often came to London, and the other was a set of English friends. My father was a strong Anglophile, and now he could enjoy that filia to its full extent. As an old English friend of mine said upon reading one of his novels that he wrote in a later life for the first time, I never realized your father was such Edwardian. 
That was exactly right. All his manners and sympathies were with the British upper class. He considered himself the American counterpart. I liked all their friends, both the new British ones and the old American ones. One couple, Henry Andrews and his wife Rebecca West, were particularly kind to us. They talked to us as for we were adults, and a compliment was not lost. Henry Andrews had great charm, and I remember with pleasure he is taking us to the circus, something he seemed to enjoy as much as we did. His manner was very gentle and soft-spoken, with a smile on his face that was encouraging and sympathetic. He gave, he gave one the feeling that this gentleness was no sham, and both statesman and child would get the same treatment. Rebecca West gave me a book on the birds of Switzerland that I treasured, although, alas, it seemed rather a dull book later. After I moved to England, my parents rented a quaint old house in the Surrey for the summer of 1933. Ceilings were so low that the footman had to stoop to serve dinner. Many years later, a good friend and colleague of mine rented such a house while on a sabbatical leave, and he told me the only way to survive in a certain parts of the house would be to wear football helmet. One day we were in a dinner for which we had to dress. I had never been able to shake the habit, but now when I come home I put on a pair of blue jeans and my father asked me where the tennis instructor was and I said he was out with his tart. There was a silence, and my father asked me if I knew what tart means. I said, I did, and repeated the answer of the young instructor. It's a short for a sweetheart. That part, that put an end to that bit of conversation, but after dinner my father asked me to come to his room. He opened up dictionary and said to me in a solemn tone, Now I'll show you what tart means. And he pointed to a word. I read it and said, What does who or means? I no longer remember what came next, but I think he gave up. And my brother Paul filled in the details. It was all well known to me, but spelling has never been my force. I had not thought about this story until a short time ago when I reread Evelyn Vaux, Handful of Dust. In it there is a very similar story with a small boy and his father. I was quite struck by the coincidence, but then I remembered my mother telling me she had sat next to Evelyn Vaux at uh, luncheon. She said he was difficult and morose, and she had to do most of the talking. I wondered if she had told him my story which had amused her so much, it would have been at a time when he might well have been working on his book. For me, that period was a key in setting a course for my life. While wandering through St. James Park in London, I would pause uh, to watch the ducks under the bridge 
and with the help of a set of bird books in our rented house, I worked hard to identify them. My other hound was the Natural History Museum in the South Kensington, which was within walking distance. The bird gallery had me spellbound. I had especially sharp memory of the small, exquisite Victorian glass cages filled with fairy-like hummingbirds and branches, all posed in the different positions. I did my first watercolor of a bird in the museum. It was duck sitting among the reeds. Subsequently, I did a few others, but noticed that each one looked slightly less effective than the one before it, which uh, brought me rather rapidly to the end of my career as a bird painter. All this happened at the same time that I was becoming increasingly involved in my solitary outings in a small wood near our school. It was a narrow strip of the trees that uh, bordered on a small brook. For me it was an idyllic spot. It was simultaneously exciting and uh, calming to my emerging self. I could watch the seasons change from fall when the leaves were shed through the snows of the winter to the glorious spring, yet all through those wonders the brook would stay the same with minor variations such as then bits of ice would form along the edge in cold weather. I hardly ever went with friends of which I had a number. This was a place where I wanted to be alone. In a childish sort of way, I felt it was my place. In the spring, with my mother's racing binoculars and a very primitive camera, I spent hours watching birds and occasionally finding a nest to photograph. The results were very rudimentary, but they gave me extraordinary pleasure. The bedroom I shared with Paul was on the side of the school near the wood, and as we drifted off to sleep in the spring, we could hear a nightingale giving its extraordinary full and varied song. Nightingales seem to me to have the same quality as great opera singers, and I heard them again in 1985 while staying with my brother Tony in Mallorca. My childhood recollection was more accurate than I imagined possible after a span of almost 60 years. My father worried that I wanted to become an uh, ornithologist and he felt instinctively that this was too narrow an occupation. To lure me on a wider horizon, he gave me a copy of The Science of Life by H. G. Wells, Julian Huxley, and G. P. Wells, which had been recently published. It was a masterstroke on his part because almost overnight I switched from birds to all living things. The book captivated me, and I uh, have always felt grateful to it, to my father's insight. It has a clear and a fascinating account of where biology was in the 1930s when I began. Many years later, I got to know Julian Huxley and G.P. Wells. Jeep Wells, a friend who shared my interest in natural history, was H.G.'s son. I could never get him to tell me about the writing of the book, and I do not quite know why, but I suspect it had something to do with the tribulation of the dealing with two rather large egos. When I got to know Huxley 
he had finished all his notable work in embryology, evolutionary biology, and animal behavior, and much of his popular writing. He visited Princeton a number of times, and I had some easy and enjoyable conversation with him. He was very sensitive about his role in the modern biology, partly because he had taken some positions of evolution that seemed it a bit mystical to some, including myself. But I greatly admired many of his contributions, such as his work on the development of sponges, on the relative growth and on animal behavior. Story I hear perfectly fits what he was like as a person. He arrived at Yale to give a lecture, and his nephew met him in a train. Huxley was elegantly dressed for his public appearance, and his nephew remarked that he looked very distinguished, to which Sir Julian replied, I am very distinguished. He was the grandson of Thomas Henry Huxley, who did so much to support the views of Charles Darwin. To close the circle, as young man H. G. Wells had taken T. H. Huxley's famous course in biology. Because biology was science, I tried to take a course in chemistry in my Swiss school, but the science instructor felt I was too young. I liked him, and it was a great disappointment to me that he had interest at all in my budding science career. In fact, for some reason, he made fun of my reading and my activities in the woods. I could never understand why, although now, no doubt, he found me priggish. It didn't deter me. I was just slightly bewildered. Had I been less determined and secure, his effect might have been devastating. At least he taught me how not to behave with one's students. Perhaps his opposition was just the thing that spurred me on. In any event, I didn't waste much time thinking about it in those early days. I set my own course, which to some degree was isolated from the rest of the world. The biology taught in school then seems very primitive now. We concentrated on zoology uh, and the textbook was a straightforward description of various phyla. There was no genetics, no evolution, there were no ideas but almost entirely description. I realized in a retrospect that I was getting the real biology of the day from my copy of Science of Life, first published in 1933. While it also offered description, it introduced me to evolution, genetics, embryology, physiology and behavior. I do not remember uh, noting this then, but I cannot help thinking that, uh, however unconsciously, it started me on a path that led to my interest today. My only direct contact with modern biology of the time was a school trip to Geneva to visit the laboratory of Professor Genot, who was pursuing some experiments with T. H. Morgan's fruit flies. I saw not only the normal red eye flies in a while with a larva crawling through the banana mesh at the bottom, but also white eye mutant, which I only appreciated many years later, was the first mutant discovered in Morgan's fly room in Columbia University. I think my only thought at the time was how much fun it must be to raise flies and do experiments. I certainly didn't have a clue as to the accomplishments of Morgan and Mandrell. I do remember that Professor Genot was a charming man with a ruddy face and beret, who clearly enjoyed captivating flock of young children. In 1934, 
After my three years in the Smith School, my father decided we must return to America for education of his boys. The reason he gave was uh, he and his father had gone to Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, and the world would fall apart if his sons did not do the same. That summer, my parents lived in an inn in Exeter with my two younger brothers, and Paul and I went to the summer school so that our European education would mesh with our new American one. I remember the summer vividly because in Switzerland the courses were given in French, and now suddenly everything was taught in English. As a result, I didn't know the right words for terms in math, such as squared and the cubed, and I pronounced my Latin in a very peculiar way, much to the delight of the other boys. The teachers would make me read the quotient of the passage from Caesar, and I had been taught, everyone except me, thought it was very funny. During that period, school continued to be heavy burden, for I was a poor scholar. My nadir was Latin. I must have spent more years with Caesar Gallic Wars than any other person in the whole history of Latin teaching. It was impossibly difficult and uh, uh, supremely dull. On top of that, my more gifted classmates kept telling me that Cicero was even worse, so that if ever managed to pass my Caesar, the uh, future would be no better. Toward the end of the year that I was taking Latin too, for the second time at Exeter, at Exeter, not to mention the summer school and the, those times in the Swiss school, my teacher asked me to stay after class. He said, do you plan to take Latin 3? I replied, not if I can help it. He then said, well, if you promise not to take it, I will pass you in the Latin 2. That shady deal was instantly sealed, followed by a joy that has lasted to this day. I had often wondered if all those years of agony might not have had a beneficial effect on my writing, although I prefer to think that if I hadn't gone through all the torture, my prose style might have been brilliant. The only concrete effect was that five years later I received a Bachelor of Science degree in Harvard rather than a Bachelor of Arts. The rule, then, was that third-year Latin was required to become a civilized Bachelor of Arts. I was a very mediocre student in school at Exeter in the 1930s. In fact, at one point, my middle-of-the-year grades were two D minuses and two E's, and only one of those could be explained by my nightmare with Leighton. At least later, I got A in biology, and I didn't fare too badly in chemistry. I remember my first chemistry teacher with some fondness. He was a thoroughly nice person, but awkward and shy. He would arrive in class in shirt sleeves and wearing a belt and suspenders before saying anything and in front of the whole class he would give a, a furtive glance behind his as thought to make sure the coast was clear of what I never knew. Then he would quickly remove his suspenders and stuff them in the top drawer of the chemical bench that served 
as a lectern. Only after a ceremony did he address the class. How could one not like such a gentle soul? The only thing that upset me was that all during the course I did not see how things held together. Chemistry seems to me a rather chaotic natural history of different elements and the compounds they make. It was only at the end of the course that uh, we were told about a periodic table. It struck me like a, a thunderbolt and everything in the chemical soap fell into place. The elements were related to one another in a beautiful and simple way, but the number of electrons that uh, floated around the corresponding uh, number of protons in the nucleus of each atom. Suddenly chemistry made sense, but I was outraged with the old dear for not telling us that in the beginning of the course. I felt that if biology were taught in Exeter, uh, then I could excel. One morning in a chapel, our remarkable headmaster, Lewis Perry, announced in his rich, sonorous voice that if any boy had any suggestions for the school or even any criticism, they should feel free to come see him. I thought about this for a few days and finally gathered enough courage to make an appointment. With a pounding heart, I was ushered into Dr. Perry's office and he beamed at me as he sat me down. I, I reminded him of his invitation and his expression suddenly turned black. Here was a complainer. I was in too deep to escape, so I told him that a school in Exeter stature should offer biology. The effect was electric and the smile came back double strength. He said he could not agree with me more. He was about to meet with a trustees and would tell them that a boy had come to urge them to act. I realized later when I thought about it that the move had already been planned and my timing had been lucky. Years later, he would introduce me as a man who brought biology to Exeter, a fiction we both enjoyed. The next year, my senior year, a young man uh, came to start up the course while he was still finishing his PhD at Harvard. I hovered around uh, Turla Thomas as he set things up, and I must have been tremendous pest. But he was a kind man and overlooked my advanced case of conceit and self-satisfaction. Much to his surprise, I got an A in the course. And when he went on to become a professor in Carleton College, we sporadically kept in touch. I admired him for his forbearance and forgiveness. The course was my first senior training in biology. It had many good effects on me, the most important of which was realization that I didn't know all of biology, which had certainly been my modest conviction at the beginning of the year. I not only learned many new things, but it was my first exposure to some scientific rigor. The whole experience had a strong influence on me and I became increasingly excited. My inner conviction that I wanted to become biologist grew ever more real as I look back at this feeling. It surprises me in retrospect that one can have such a broad enthusiasm at such an early age. Birds had taken the back seat. Now it was all of biology.
It was only much later that my interest narrowed down and became more focused. This is the principle of Karl Ernst von Bayer, the famous early 19th century embryologist, who among other things discovered the mammalian egg. He promulgated his law that says that during the development of an animal embryo, first general characters appear, and later the life of the embryo one sees that the more specific characters of the species reveal themselves. Well, I was still very early in my development and I was quite content with all of biology. In fact, even now I have retained some of this interest in all things biological, despite my eventual special interest in the slime molds, of which I will have more to say later. Perhaps it is good that I still have not completely grown up. It was during this period that I learned to drive. I managed moderately well and uh, finally had to go take my test. In that rural community, an elderly man who looked like a mild form of uh, Teddy Roosevelt gave examination. I went to him in his small white house and told him I was ready to take the road test. He asked me a few questions, the last one of which was did I like classical music or jazz best. After a pause, I told him in a somewhat apologetic fashion that I liked both, but classical music was my favorite. He then informed me that I did not need a road test. I could get my license because in his experience, young people who liked classical music drove more carefully and not so fast as those who just liked jazz. I wished he had been my Latin teacher. Even though I did an average job on the college boards, with the exception of biology where I distinguished myself, my father and some of my teachers thought I was too immature for a college and should wait a year. This idea was reinforced when I learned that I had been accepted at Harvard on trial because of my general performance. I was absolutely adamant that I would go right away and my determination carried the day. My only object in 1937 was to go to place where they taught numerous biology courses. Because I had already taken the basic biology course at Exeter and uh, taught uh, by a man from a biology department at Harvard, I was allowed to go directly in the second year course, which in those days was a year of botany. Uh, plants made me just as happy as animals, so I, I was overjoyed. First half of the course was uh, lower plants and included bacteria, algae, and fungi, and it was taught by Professor William H. Weston. Cap Weston, as he was known to all his colleagues and all his more advanced students, was a remarkable man who had a great influence over me, probably even in a way that I do not recognize to this day. We all adored him as a person and as someone who understood how science was done. It is quite remarkable that he was held a veneration by some many students. Both undergraduates and doctoral students, despite the fact that he himself did very little research on his own. His creativity was expressed through his students. He guided them and uh, prodded them to do clever and ingenious experiments in uncharted waters. 
And as a result, the collective research output from his group was unrivaled in its novelty and originality. And his standards were exceedingly high, so that every aspect of science and its presentation had to be impeccable. I started doing research with him at the end of my freshman year and continued through to the finish of my PhD. This is not the standard way of doing things, but an alternative and never occurred to me. Part of his wonderful personality included his ability to let his students forge ahead on their own, and he was there to provide the encouragement for very blunt if one was doing something silly or wrong. He wanted his students to learn to fly solo, and it never seemed to cross his mind that a good share of the credit should be his. When I first attended his class, I liked him instantly. He was thin, big-boned, and over six feet tall, with a mod of very blonde hair. He wore gold-rimmed glasses, and even in response there was a smile on his face. He wore a hearing aid, kind that now seems almost antique as an ear horn. It had a long wire from his ear to a black box that had batteries and a receiver microphone that he had clipped on his shirt pocket. I have this clear memory of a young woman asking a question in one that first lectures of the course some distance from the podium. He smiled, shook his head, and said, hold on a minute. He raised down the aisle, detached his black receiver box, and bending his tall frame, he placed the box on the desk in front of her, saying, would you please Repeat the question, my dear. His lectures were a model. He had remarkable ability to put elegant sentences together at the same time manage to make the most mundane topic seem fascinating. He interlaced his lectures with essays and uh, humorous stories that not only kept one in rapt attention, but made it so the biology was hard not to absorb. As a young, eager freshman, I had never experienced anything like this, and I was overwhelmed. My first university course in biology not only influenced my uh, future as a teacher, but caused me to fall in love with the algae and fungi, and I decided right away that I wanted to become a cryptogamic botanist, as anyone working with those lower plants was called at that time. They seemed like a, such a simple organism, yet uh, so varied in their structure and in their life cycles. The laboratory of the course was a bit of the past that no longer exists, but I relished it. It consisted almost entirely of examining various plants, usually leaf specimen accompanying, accompanied by prepared slides, and then drawing them with utmost care. In the beginning, one uh, had to learn how to make scientific drawing. There were set rules. The pencil had to be very hard and sharp, the paper, the right kind of a drawing board, and the walls of the cell were to have two parallel lines to exactly reflect their thickness. Everyone automatically claimed they could not draw, but were firmly told they would learn. <laughs> 
which we did. I still uh, have my antique laboratory drawings. They do not show talent, but diligence. Our laboratory instructor was a young and very shy graduate student who was made doubly shy by a new policy, which was to have women from Radcliffe in their course with a Harvard man. Earlier, all courses were segregated, and the professors had to give the lectures twice to the men and the women separately. It was still true for some courses, but Botany I was a new ex experiment in coeducation. I nearly fell out of my seat one day when a very fresh young woman, who was quizzing the teaching assistant, and who must have enjoyed making him blush, asked in a very loud voice, Is it true that women masturbate more often than men? There was an audible gasp around the room, and I thought the poor instructor was going to faint. I knew right then the world was changing. As must be evident, I flourished in a Cap Western course. It was all I could possibly have wished for. In the middle of the Cap came into the lab one day with my Exeter biology teacher, and I heard them say that, considering I was doing very well. I'm not sure they didn't mean me to hear. In any event, I was greatly excited by the favorable verdict. My interest in life cycles must have subconsciously started that freshman year for a variety of life cycles among the organisms in CAPS course was enormous. From simple single-cell organisms that just divide and expand in a succession of infinitum, ad infinitum, to huge, elaborate brown algae like kelp and complex fungi such as mushrooms. In the larger forms, it was not just that they developed into something much more elaborate, but each kind of organism had interesting variations in the sequence of its cycle. Cap's course was primarily a sort of comparative natural history. Here was the variety of living lower forms, and we were looking at them in the spirit of 19th century descriptive biology. It must have stamped a sort of template in my mind, of which I made great use later on. During the year I had increasingly frequent conversation with Dr. Weston, I still called him then. It was his suggestion that I might want to take the algae course at Woods Hall that was given every summer at the Marine Biologi Biological Laboratory by Professor William Randolph Taylor. I jumped at the chance, but it turned out they only took graduate students and certainly not a freshman. However, Dr. Weston went to bed for me and persuaded Dr. Taylor I was just the person he wanted. So, with my parents' blessing and enough money to live on and pay my fees, I was off to the mecca of biologists to take what seemed to me the road to bliss. I don't think Dr. Taylor felt he had made mistake at meeting someone so young. Also, I did one unpopular thing. We had practical tests where different unknown algae were put in dishes and we had to identify them by uh, keying them down in a book. One of the students had lovely curly red hair and persuaded her to spare a lock that I put in a dish along with the unknowns.
The other students enjoyed the joke, but the professor was not amused. Again, this was the sort of biology that barely exists today. One became oriented toward one group of organisms, and one tried to learn everything about them. The first and classical approach was to learn the classification of the group and understand their diversity. Once that was under one's belt, then one could worry about the details of their life history. And lastly, which was kept Western strength, one could plan experiments to understand how their life history is controlled. I was having such a good time in a woods hall that I tried to seize the opportunity uh, of staying on for a second half of the summer to work on a research project. I asked Dr. Taylor if this would be possible, and to my surprise, he agreed and even suggested a problem to work on a cell structure of a common algae known as a C lattice. Ulva. He added, however, that I could only begin the problem at Woods Hall, and I would need Dr. Weston's permission to continue with it at Harvard. It was overjoyed. I was overjoyed and wrote to Dr. Weston. Fortunately, I still have his reply. In many ways, it was the beginning for me, my first step at doing laboratory research and I was thrilled to the bone. Here is the part of his letter. Dear Bonner, it certainly does my old heart good to hear from you, and it is no end rejuvenating to relieve in your enthusiastic descriptions my own experiences at Woods Hall years ago. I can see you are getting a lot out of it, both in the work itself, in the contact with interesting workers in other fields, and in association with men like the Admiral, Dr. Taylor to you, my boy, and others. Now, as to the research, so far as I am concerned, the one sentence, I am sure of one thing, and that is that I want very much to do it, settles the matter. Ulva is an excellent possibility. The alternation of generations which has been worked out in the uh, clamors for uh, father cytological illumination. Think nothing of the drawback of carrying on such a work here as undergraduate. That can be arranged. I can unofficially assign you a table and equipment in room 490, and you can carry on with your work as opportunity permits. Nor is the lack of osmic acid too great a drawback, for I have secured some and I am sending it to you by mail. So, with all obstacles more or less cleared up for the time being, plunk into Ulva with all good wishes for the best of luck. Heaven! During my next year, I spent many hours uh, sectioning and staining the Ulva I had so carefully collected and prepared at the Woods Hall. I was discovering how to make microscope slides the old-fashioned way, embedding the tissues in a paraffin and cutting them into thin sections with a special machine holding a very fine knife. It was learning a craft, a skill that stood me in a good stead later on. I loved the process. And I love the companionship of all the graduate students who would kindly give me helpful advice. I felt the opportunity and privilege that had been bestowed on me. My only disappointment was the object of all this great effort, Olva, uh, 
had miserably small chromosomes, and because of the stiff cell walls, was hard to section cleanly. The year was not wasted because I learned how to do many useful things. I also learned that it is best to pick one's own problem and not to rely on the judgment of others, no matter how well-meaning and respected they might be. Being a college student in the 1930s was different in many ways from what it is now. In the first place, we all wore jackets and necktits, necktis for classes and meals. There were waitresses in the dining halls. Cafeterias were something that came during and after the Second World War. We also had biddies to clean up rooms and make our beds. I do not want to give the impression that I yearn for those aspects of the old days because I do not, but I have to confess I do have one regret. Our Biddy, who must have been in her fifties, as were all the others, was a sort of kind, motherly soul that all undergraduates needed. We confided our minor troubles and anxieties to her, and what she gave us in return was sympathetic comfort and good advice. We knew she was on our side, and I remember being especially touched when I was rushing off to a big exam. I said to her, as I dashed out of the room, that I was very concerned about it, but she said, don't worry, you'll do well. I burned a candle for you in church last night. I passed the exam. Bless her. In my sophomore year, I began to feel as though I was becoming part of the university. I was now with my roommates in one of the houses, and I began taking more advanced courses. For the first time in my life, I found myself also enjoying courses other than biology. One was French literature given uh, by Professor Allard. His lectures were games, but he talked as though there was no one in the room. He seemed wrapped up in his stratosphere. This was misleading. Once my brother Henry was visiting and brought him along to class. In the middle of his lecture, Professor Allard stopped, glowered at Henry, and bowed him out severely for not taking notes. There was no chance of my explaining. I loved the reading, all those bits of less classics that I had missed at school. Some of my other courses were less successful. I seemed to be too greatly influenced by the person teaching it. The subject of geology interested me, but the professor managed to dampen all my enthusiasm. In an early lecture, he said that a messy desk was a sign of messy mind, and he went on to exhort us to keep both orderly. I found this such a potently absurd bit of sermonizing that from the instant on he was on my black list. He made his second unforgivable mistake by asking us on our first test what kind of stone were the steps leading to the building made of. I didn't mind getting it wrong. But then, to be told afterwards that I had weak powers of observation was a bit too much. The opening lecture of a course in the history of science put me in such fury that I instantly dropped the course. 
which in retrospect was probably a great mistake. It was given by Professor L. J. Henderson, whom later I came to admire for a number of reasons. I did, however, suffer from protruding ego, and in this opening lecture he said that the study of the history of science was the study of genius, and that it resulted in an immediate problem for him. He was able to present the material without difficulty because he was a genius himself. His problem came in trying to explain this to a bunch of ordinary adults, namely us. I couldn't believe any good could come from the sort of nonsense, but some years later, after I had finished my doctorate, I became trapped by the beautiful prose of the Harvard historian of science, George Sarton, and suddenly saw all the things I had missed, although it was not too late. I wrote to Professor Sarton to complain that I spent all those years in Harvard and I had taken none of his courses nor even met him. He sent me a charming reply. My other science courses were a mixed bag. I thought Professor Julius Fieser's a huge course in organic chemistry was inspired not only because of his teaching of chemistry, but also because of his skill at handling that multitude of students. Uh, his morning greeting was great his from the whole class. which always generated the most wonderful grain, as for uh, he was a great concert pianist who had just received ovation. And we students meant it was way. He did all sorts of things to increase the his, uh, such as wearing an incredibly red tie on St. Patrick's Day, one notable moment was when he demonstrated the use of mordant for a dye. He held up a piece of white cloth and told us that mordant had been put on only part of the cloth. He then plunked it in a great beaker of red dye, making great fuss, stirring it. It came up all bright red. Then he plunked it into another beaker containing plain water, again with dramatic stirring, to wash off the dye, where there had been no mordant. Finally, he held up the cloth in the great big red letters. It said, Test Friday. The hisses mixed with laughter reached a new level. To me, intellectually most satisfying course was in physical chemistry taught by Professor E. Bright Wilson. It stretched me beyond my mathematical capacities, which was an exciting, frightening new experience. Many years later, I was advising biology students at a course choosing time and my advice asked me if she should take physical chemistry. I said, by all means. I told her that taking it as an undergraduate, it was the best thing I ever did in my biological career. She nodded and asked me with a moderate politeness, did I not realize that what I learned in my physical chemistry back then, they now teach in the general chemistry course. At the end of my sophomore year, I had experience that father helped to guide me on my path. The houses at Harvard were patterned 
around the Oxford-Cambridge system of colleges, and we were assigned tutors with whom we met periodically. My tutor was a spirited man named Charles Easterday Wren. His claim to fame was his discovery of the cause of wasting disease of ill grass. It was result of infection by a curious amoeba-like organism, Labyrinthula, which was great interest in itself. He was enthusiast, and he was quite convinced that the most interesting kind of biology was applied, and that is what I should pursue. He suggested I seek volunteer job in a mosquito control project of the Tennessee Valley Authority, for he had friends there who could use young research helper. It seemed to me like an idea well worth trying, so I agreed and went down to Mosquito headquarters at Wilson Dam in June 1939. I had never been to the real South before. And therefore, besides the unfamiliar kind of science, I was to have many new experiences. Everyone was welcoming and kind, and I soon found a room in a boarding house. I remember with affection my motherly landlady, who was always full of good advice and help. Her house was in Tuscumbia, Alabama the home of Helen Keller. The first shock was the incredible heat. Those were days well before air conditioning. I had clear memories of taking cool shower before bed, lying naked on the sheet and uh, pouring sweet until I fell asleep. The second shock was the kind of work heat we did. We spent days sometimes up to our waists to the swamps, counting mosquito larvae. Some of the swamps had been sprayed with arsenic, others not, and our job was to determine how effective the spraying had been. I did not mind the out-of-door labor. What uh, oppressed me was stultifying intellectual scope of the whole project. The small matter of spraying arsenic all over the place only seems grotesque in retrospect. At the time, no one foresaw any problems it might create. That was not my difficulty. It simply uh, could not imagine, I simply could not imagine how anyone found such a project of any interest at all. It might have been useful, and indeed uh, malaria was a serious menace, but how could such mountain procedure capture the imagination of anyone? I decided that my friend and sponsor Charles Rand must be out of his mind. We also collected adult mosquitoes from houses. And this was my introduction to the very poor, mostly white communities. Their houses were ruinous shacks, their dress and their manner pathetically slovenly. The small children would be wandering about covered with dirt and with seggy, soiled diapers. They talked to us if reserve and distrust. At a Saturday night dance, I saw one man in a buff uh, uh, hit another man over the head with a hair bottle and knock him out. An equally drunk, short, fat policeman in a neighboring booth rushed over, leaning over what looked to me like the corpse, began 
blowing his whistle non-stop for some minutes. I remember a sign in front of small village store that said, be respectful to women. They were not a happy bread, breed. My colleagues were a great disappointment. And it was not just that they treated me at the lowest man on the totem pole, which I was. I never had one conversation about biology. Political conversations were frequent as they were distressing. All the problems of the world were caused by Catholics and Jews. Blacks lived in another world that we hardly ever seemed to enter. Once a week, all the members of the group and their wives met someone's house. The hospitality was generous and thoughtful, but after everyone had their beer in hand, we would sit around a circle telling mildly dirty stories. The women participated with appropriate blushes and disclaimers. I decided that I was not cut out for applied biology. In the middle of the summer, I got a call from my colleague, roommate. He said his brother had just graduated and was given a car. Could I join them to drive out to the West Coast and back? I never made a decision so fast in my life. I said my goodbyes and was on the train to New York in a flash. It was one of my better decisions. A good way of understanding what modern biology was in the 1930s is to look at the courses I took. There was a tremendous uh, surge of interest in biochemistry, which uh, had the peculiar result that certain current hot subjects were taught in a number of courses, including biochemistry courses. I think I must have been forced to learn the chemical details of intermediary metabolism four or five times over. The high point for me was biochemistry course given by George Wald, who was probably the best lecturer I had ever known. He also ran the lab himself. But alas, the main thing I remember is blowing up flask containing uh, chlorophyll in alcoholic solution. I had attached uh, it. I, I had it attached to a vacuum pump, but it was the wrong kind of flask. Beautiful green solution just covered my lab partner's white lab coat from top to bottom. Fortunately, she was not hard, just green. Embryology was flourishing, although the progress seems modest compared to what we know today. Biochemical embryology was making important of a rudimentary beginning. For instance, the early attempts to identify the chemical nature of sperm organizer or inductor were mainly unsuccessful. By the time population genetics, which was a fusion of classical genetics with evolution, had come into full bloom, it was fruitful use of mathematics to understand genetics change in a population and in this way account for evolution in terms of the changes in gene frequencies. The effect of selection mutation, population size, and other parameters could be given specific values, making it possible to analyze and model evolution in a formal but insightful way. The prime innovators in this important enterprise were R. A. Fisher, Sewell Wright, and J. B. S. Haldane. 
Once the core ideas had been established, others explored ramifications for natural populations in what became the new synthesis, as Julian Huxley dubbed it. There was no appropriate course in Harvard, so for one semester Alfred Sturtevant, one of the stars of T.H. Morgan's laboratory, came to teach course on the subject, which was an exciting event. Our textbook was uh, uh, Dobzhansky's, another veteran of uh, Morgan's fly room, Genetics and Origin of Species, an exceedingly influential book that showed how genetics illuminated evolution. In later years, I got to see, and now some of these men, especially Helden, of which more later, uh, Fisher came to Princeton to give lecture that I remember well for two reasons. It was on the complex genetics of uh, rhesus factors in blood, and I didn't understand a word, and most of the time he talked, he turned sideways to the audience and fixed his eyes on a piece of chalk. He kept twirling about two inches from his eyes. One semester in 1960s, Sturtevant came to Princeton to teach a more modern version of the same course, and I had some enjoyable conversations with him. He had a quiet, reserved, almost shy manner that seemed at odds with inventive lightning brain. In the middle of my undergraduate years, after I realized that my first research effort was not gaining to succeed, I became progressively more engrossed in the problems of animal embryology. At first, I had no thought of uh, doing research in the area, but the whole question of how an egg turned out into animal with all its fantastic complexity seemed to me exceptionally interesting matter, one that bristled with questions beckoning for answers. The only point that bothered me was the complexity. I realized that is what I found so appealing about the lower plants. They were re relatively simple by comparison. One day, very obvious thought occurred to me. Why not have the best of both those worlds? After all, algae and fungi developed too. They started off as a fertilized egg or an asexual spore and grew into an adult. The only difference was that an alga or a fungus adult was a simple uh, compared to frog or animal with their vast number of internal organs and different kinds of cell types. Why not study embryology or more properly development as it has come to be called in the lower plants. This seemed to me eminently desirable from a scientific point of view, and I had the key value that I could continue to work under Cap Weston. Next came the question of what lower organism would be a convenient object of study. I spent hours talking to graded students and postdoctoral fellows, and of course, Cap Weston. I was seriously tempted by some water molds, a particular passion of Cap's, until one day, quite by chance, I picked Kenneth Raper's PhD thesis off the shelf outer office. He had done his graduate work with Cap few years earlier. It was a splendid bit of work on slime molds that gave me 
the most wonderful feeling of this is it. The cellular slime molds were a little known group of amoeba that have a very unusual life cycle. They are extremely common organisms in virtually all soils, but they are hard to see, except in a laboratory, because they are so small. As a separate amoeba, after clearing an area of bacteria that they eat, they stream together in large numbers to form an instantaneous multicellular organism. This newly created cell mass in the new species that Raper had discovered looks like an amino slug and in all ways acts like a single multicellular organism. It has uh, a front and a hind end and it will orient toward light and in a heat gradient. After a period of migration, it stops, writes itself, and shoots up into the air, forming a minute uh, fruiting body uh, a few millimeters tall, in which some of the cells have given rise to the stalk, and each one of the other cells, which are lifted up into the air as the stalk rises, turns into a sexual spore. I could instantly see those minute beasts had everything I was looking for. Instead of having hundreds of cell types, as we and all other vertebrates have in our bodies, they have two stock cells and spores. In the laboratory, they are easy to grow and from a single spore, it is possible to get a generation in four to five days. I immediately wrote to Kenneth Raper, who kindly sent me cultures and encouraging note. I felt incredibly lucky. By the time I graduated, I had worked with slime molds for two years. I had not really made any significant discoveries during that time, but it was not time wasted, for I made many observations that were helpful to me later. My undergraduate thesis was well received, largely, I suspect, because I submitted it with a 16 millimeter film I had made of a slime mold development. With the help of departmental photographer that was striking. Considering what now seems like antique equipment that I had at my disposal, the good result was especially remarkable. The only bumble moment came after I had spent hours with small press printing and then photographing the title. When it came back, after having been processed days later, to my utter distress, I had made a simple spelling mistake in a large, bold print. Spelling has never been my fault, but this was so bad I recognized the mistake myself nowadays with a video camera on the microscope live has become very much easier. The thesis uh, itself uh, seems to me terribly immature as I look at it now. Cap Weston was a stickler for writing paper or thesis with the uttermost care. He felt strongly that it was not only his job to teach one how to do research, but how to present it as well, both on the paper and in a lecture. He went over my thesis with his 
usual, usual care, and when I went to see him, he smiled, shook his head, saying, John, I hardly know where to begin to tell you what is wrong with this. It is not in a form fit for publication, nor even a standard thesis. Redoing it would be a major task, and anyhow, there is no enough time. The only way I can describe it, to say it is pure boner. All you can do is submit it and take your chances. It must now be clear why I think the film helped. There is a sequel to the story of Immature Thesis, the first part of which was on the use of symbolic logic as a tool to analyze slime mold development. In the 1960s, I had visit from the old friend who was distinguished mathematician and we were to have lunch together. Just before we went, I had some business to do and I asked him to wait on my office where there were lots of books to keep him occupied for 10 minutes. When I returned to my dismay, I found him reading my senior thesis. I asked him, with all those good books here, how could you be reading that? He said it was wonderful. And after I expressed total skepticism, he said, it's wonderful that you got this out of your system at such an early age. I see now that there was another important thought that was beginning to form in my mind. As I worked with those slime molds, I became increasingly conscious of the fact that their life cycle was quite radically different from those of most organisms. The majority of plants and animals, including ourselves, begin as a single cell that is supplied with the food reserves, such as yolk, and after a period of growth and cell division, start to feed and bring energy from the outside world. In plants, energy is captured by producing photosynthetic structures such as leaves. In animals, once we have formed mouth and gut tube, we begin to eat. The slime molds, on the other hand, eat first as a separate amoeba, and after their plate is clean, of their bacterial food, they stream together and develop into a multicellular form, a fruiting body with stalk cells and spores. They seem to have an inverted cycle where they food they feed first and then form multicellular organism, while we do the opposite and grow into multicellular organism first and then start feeding. More than anything, this difference uh, combined with all those other life histories I had encountered in Cape Weston's course started me thinking about life cycles and how central they were to very meaning of life. The 1930s was an ex era in which we all felt gathering storm generated by Mussolini and especially by Hitler. It was a period where the Jewish refugees from Nazis began to trickle into Europe and America. We all knew it was leading into darkness. I was driving across Texas in the middle of the night with any roommate with my roommate 
and his brother when on the car radio we hear Hitler's speech announcing his annexation of Czechoslovakia. It was a chilling moment. Everyone was to feel the repercussion of his evil in the years to come, including his own countrymen.